Welcome to the Dean Blackman Show, live from Long Island. Free-flowing talk with a charismatic, down-to-earth host. Join Dean as he interviews and chats freely with his guests, ranging from superstar athletes to politicians, industry titans, and everyday folk with fascinating life stories. Dean educates, entertains, and most of all, touches people's lives. You're listening to The Dean Blackman Show, live from Long Island. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Dean Blackman Show. Here we are in Setauket, Long Island. My featured guest is Sheila Skolnick. Sheila, good morning. How are you today? Good morning, Dean, and how are you? Um, it's pretty cool here out uh, out in the island where we live here on the north shore of Long Island, Setauket. It is cool and sunny, though. You bet. I think you've uh, you're much younger than me, but you've uh, you've lived out here. Uh, I few think a, a few years longer than me. But uh, it's quite refreshing to have a woman in the studio. We've uh, we haven't had that. Uh, it's been it's been pretty dominant here. Hmm. Some of the guests have come in uh, over Skype audio, but uh, there hasn't been too many uh, female guests, and uh, it's great to see that here. So, uh, also in the studio here is your uh, your husband, your lovely husband Michael. Michael so, Tegudis. Michael, thank you for being here today. Um, but uh, we got a great show here today for the audience. Um, very impressed. Uh, you know, when I first started off uh, the uh, show, I the vision was all subjects, all industries, everyone could come in here as welcome that has a story and experience. And from what I know of yours, it's uh, it's quite remarkable. And we always try here to inspire, uh, motivate, and educate our audience. And you've been doing that your entire life. Um, it's pretty impressive. You these days, uh, known as the business doctor, you're a professional trainer, coaching, business speaker, consultant, but going back to your early years in business, uh, I can appreciate it more than anybody based on my experiences and my family's experiences in business. It's quite a story and experience that I'm anxious to have my audience hear. Uh, what happened to you in business? I mean, you created and started your own national and international hotel supply company with absolutely no money, no experiences, no mentors, and absolutely no connections. I mean, that's incredible, a story all by itself. I mean, you eventually, years later, you sold your business to a $6 billion company, which is the hotel supply division of Enterprise uh, Rental Cars. I mean, you had incredible personal challenges growing up, uh, growing up in poverty, uh, almost non-existent education, uh, dysfunctional home life, uh, very dangerous neighborhood. Um, you taught yourself to read in high school, uh, really a tough mindset, a woman that really, really from your youthful uh, ages, just really in the trenches. I, I think, how's that introduction? Is there anything that I, that I missed there? No, I guess I can go home now. <laughs> <laughs> Did a good job. Okay. Did a good always, job. Always, always good to have some humor on the show. Besides inspiration and education and motivation, it's mm -hmm. always great to uh, laugh on the show. But thank, thank you so much for coming here. I think we have our coldest uh, two days here out on the North Shore of Long Island. We do, we do. So, but it, uh, it, like I says, it's sunny, so it's it's all good. So listen, let's let's just go back in time and uh, really, uh, really go back before you started uh, your consulting business and your speaking. I mean, it all started really with your personal uh, life story. I mean, even before you got into business, uh, pretty, pretty challenging times for you growing up as a young woman. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, I'll start there. At the end of the day, I created a company like you had mentioned, with no money, no connections, nothing, and grew it into a multi, multi-million dollar business. And I taught and trained myself everything that uh, I needed to know. And because I had no mentors, it didn't have to look a certain way. And that was the secret of my success. I didn't know how I was supposed to do it or what I was supposed to do, so I just did it. So that made me very unique in the industry. So, but going back to my childhood, people always go, oh, you started this very elaborate business, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, they go, how did you do it? What'd you, did your parents get you money? Was it your husband's business? What was it? And I say, no, it's something I created out of need. 
you know, I didn't start off in the world saying, gee, I'm going to build a business. I started off in the world saying, you know, I want to grow up and be a mommy and have children and be married and live happily ever after. But somehow the thoughts in our brain don't always uh, turn out how we wanted it. When I was a child, um, I grew up in uh, 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 Brooklyn housing projects called Howard Projects in East New York, which okay. was still today one of the toughest, toughest, scariest places you can grow up. And, you know, I often think back, you know, how did I do what I do? I think it was my childhood experiences that taught me how to be in business because business is survival from time to time. And my childhood was totally a time of surviving. And of course, as a little four-year-old, five-year-old, I didn't know I was surviving. I was just living day to day to day. But as I was going through my day, I was learning things, believe it or not, years later that would help me grow my business. So my... Um, in my home, of course, it was a, a very difficult place because uh, there were some problems in the home, and my schools were a nightmare. Um, half of the children could not speak English, and the other half had no parental guidance. Hmm. There were 1,200 families in these projects, wow. and the average family had six to 10 children. Wow. So um, even when I went to school for the first time, believe it or not, there were two kids in a seat. I remember that because I was looking for my seat and I go, hmm, no seat. And someone says, well, go sit next to blah, blah, blah. And so I did. So went through school and um, you learned nothing. It was just a matter of, you know, the teacher trying to get us to sit in our seats, stay still and just be quiet. Hmm. And um, as a matter of fact, in sixth grade, before we were going to go off to our next school, the teacher wrote something on the blackboard, and I was looking at it, and she was saying, I want everyone to copy this down, because you'll need it later on. And she was writing numbers, number one with an X, another number two with a equal, whatever that was, and I had no idea. And she said, we all copied everything she wrote, and then she said, this is called the times table. Wow. And so... I have an excuse. <laughs> um, so we went from that school. Uh, actually, we had to leave in a hurry because a pipe had fallen through the ceiling. And we all had to get out, and they, they moved us to another school, and this was a, a middle-income school. And I was in the class, in a class with my same classmates. And I'm, you know, I feel real comfortable because that's there, there was one of my class great mates from kindergarten to sixth grade. And all of a sudden, there was this tall, skinny man that shows up at the door, looks around the classroom, and sees me and all my classmates, and made a decision um, based on my color that I did not belong in that class. Wow. And he said, you know, take your books and follow me. So I did what he said, and I followed him into a class of everyone with my color. And I sat down, and the teacher asked me to stand up and read. I looked down at the book, and it had these teeny tiny little letters, and I could not read, not a single word. You were what age at this point? Uh, uh, jun oh, by then I was in junior high school. Junior high school. However old you are then. Wow. And so... You were probably 12, 13 years old at that time. Yeah, I wow. guess so. Um, so, like my, my books that we had, there were big, giant, one-inch letters, and the words were C, Tom, C, Jane, Run. I mean, literally mm. nothing. So the, the teacher, after experiencing this with me, she left the room in a huff and told me to sit down. And then in came this tall, skinny man again and with an angry-looking face and said, follow me. And they put me in, in a class for the next three years for children with learning disabilities. Wow. And... Um, so there I stayed, still did not learn to read, still did not learn anything. And it was a horrific, horrific three years. So it's my understanding you self-taught yourself at, uh, at home. Well, um, I got to high school. Uh, we had moved to another community. And what finally got us to move was I was walking with my dad. <clears throat> and I had said, Daddy, when am I going to get a big belly like my girlfriend Evelyn? That was the question I asked him, and the next thing I knew, we moved within 12 days somehow. 
we were gone. Really? <laughs> we were gone. Wow. So then we moved into a middle class uh, community. And anyway, I got to go to this school called um, Tilden High School, which was one of the best schools in the five boroughs. Wow. Um, and I'm, I walk in and I look around and I'm so happy. I go to sit down in the first row. And then they started passing the books back, passed it back, passed it back. And I looked in the book, and it was heavy. And I looked inside, and it was like, oh, my God, this is not going to work. Because once again, it was teeny tiny letters. And I got so scared because I knew there was no place they can put me mm. in this school. So I made a decision right then and there that I was going to teach myself to read. Wow. And every day after school, I went home, and I taught myself to read. And it took a full year for me to teach myself because I there was no one to help teach me and I so I, you couldn't learn to read in school you had to uh, teach yourself at home yeah there was you were determined to do that yeah who was going to teach me to read wow. you know reading is a whole process all by itself right you know um and and so you know if I was to go through my science books and all my other books uh I would have to learn to read so you know while being in school my teachers used to ask me things like what country do you come from and uh because I had an accent you know, I had an accent. I only moved uh, like three miles, but I had an accent like I came from another country and mm. my culture was different. Uh, and so it was really hard. It was it was really, really hard in, in high school. It wasn't dangerous anymore and mm. it wasn't scary anymore. The scary and dangerous was gone. Now it was just a matter of getting myself to read and trying to catch up. Uh, at the end of the day, my proudest moment in high school, my proudest moment was on my regents exam. I got an 87 in wow, English. Wow, that's so, incredible, incredible. Well, f that was incredible. That was something that made me personally very happy. And, right. you know, I caught up, you know, obviously I had to catch up. And so that that was, um, all that was my training for business. So so uh, that those, those experiences, uh, childhood experiences there in those early years of school really, uh, catapulted uh, had a tremendous impact on you for uh, what eventually became uh, the remarkable business success that you uh, later on in the years that followed mm -hmm. um, how about uh, after high school you went to college I I went to college where, where did you go to college um, Brooklyn community I think okay it was. okay um, then I got married and um, the Marriage didn't work out, okay. and I knew that I'd have to uh, earn a living if I was going to leave with my two sons. Okay. So I started selling um, Stanley Home products door to door, you know, while my children were um, napping, and uh, I discovered it was so cool. I'd knock on a door, and mm. I'd go inside and and uh, I'd say to the woman, oh, let me show you what this furniture polish could do. And I'd rub the table and it would shine. And I said, isn't this great? She says, yeah, and she'd buy a can. And I got all excited about that. Wow. And then I sold to everybody, you know, within two blocks, you know, within two blocks. And then this other company heard about me and said, would you like to come work for me? And I always worked as an outside contractor. That means they, the company had the products, I would sell it, they would invoice it and they would deliver. Right, it. you were not a company employee. You were an outside contractor. Always. You were self-employed. Well, actually, I started my self-employment when I was going door to door selling Stanley so, Home products. So, was this? I, I wanted to ask you: Was this your really first job that you that you had, or prior, or what did you did you have uh, uh, part time? Did you did you do part time work? Uh, I never did part time work. No. Because especially when I was in high school, I mean, I spent all my time teaching myself, training myself. I mean, I had all those years and years to try to catch up with. I mean, I was yeah. totally, uh, totally. It's like I just got plopped into education in in high school. I mean, when people uh, when people ask me that question, I'll never forget it. Uh, you know, we had some uh, the Blackmans. Uh, we had. Uh, it was a lot of uh, being in the trenches and some tough, difficult times. Uh, matter of fact, my mom uh, was my first guest. My 89-year-old mother from Delray Beach, Florida, was the first guest on my show. I thought mm -hmm. that was very appropriate. And she's been on a couple of other times where we call her randomly. And every week I get letters and text messages. You got to have your mother on every week. <laughs> 
but uh, if you get a chance, you've got to uh, listen to her show. Um, mm. You know, some of uh, some of the most uh, best times in her life were during those difficult times and those challenging times. And uh, you know, I grew up in Freeport on mm -hmm. the South Shore of Long Island. For anyone that doesn't know where Freeport is. And, uh, you know, as I told you and Mike, when you came into the house, uh, you know, the history of my family, uh, two sets of twin boys, and then they had Dean, five sons that I'll never forget, which a lot of that is is kind of lost today in this young generation that when people ask me uh, what was my first job or work, I remember with my brothers and I, we used to go out there to the neighborhood and we used to uh, cut people's lawns. Mm -hmm. uh, collectively, the five of us, uh, when we'd have snowstorms, we would uh, in Freeport, we'd go from door to door and uh, we'd make some money uh, shoveling people's driveways and their walks. I mean, you don't you don't see that today. It's a it's a different world. So uh, that's why I wanted to get into. Well, like, that's why I wanted to get into because it's it, it's easy to talk about uh, all the great success we had and uh, failures uh, because failures are important too to success in business. But it's really, I really wanted to go back into your early childhood years because it really, that, that, it really all starts there. First of all, there are, those are years that were not happy, right. that were not great. Right. I don't have a single, that was horrific. It was a nightmare for me. Hmm. Okay. My good time came later in my life. I mean, growing up in insanity and in, in a horrific neighborhood, there are no good times there. Right. That's It's all 100% pure survival, mm. which I survived and, and I survived, you know. Yeah, so it's a remarkable the, story. So the good part of it is um, later in my life, uh, I appreciate everything so much where people go through periods of time where, you know, did this, done that. For me, everything was wonderful and mm. terrific and, and, um, I, I'm I'm just so thankful and grateful for everything that I have today, and I made it I made it so by going and doing it. You know, I have I t what I do now is I I'm a I'm a consultant and I'm a coach, and I'm a business consultant and I also speak. I do speaking engagements. What I do is I train people on my principles of business, and my principles of business were are based on my history. Mm. For example, the most important thing I teach and train is, if it's to be, it's up to me. You don't blame mom, dad, the culture, uh, society, or anybody. You handle things yourself. You mm. keep all your power right here within you so you could make changes, so you can control your life, so you don't go, oh, my, my life's terrible because of blah, blah, blah. I could have done that. But for some reason, I didn't. And don't tell me. I don't know why. Um, I don't know why I took that path. But I just kept going and going and going. And I never had the thought, for whatever reason, that um, that it wasn't. Nothing was for me. Everything was possible. And every day, I got up and I survived my household and got to school and back without getting hurt. That was extremely incredible. You know, that was a good day for me. Mm. And of course, when I when I started selling, it was like, wow, you know, this is easy. Mm. This is a piece of cake. You just walk up to people and 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 you show them something, and if it works for them, they're happy and they give you money. It was like, wow, that wow. is so cool. Sheila, I don't know how you feel, but this generation, this young generation now coming out of college, uh, you know, before they even look at what uh, fields they're going to go into or industries. I think, and you and I have this in common because uh, when I came into my business uh, in 79, uh, four of my brothers were inside Twin Lab in different capacities, whether it be manufacturing, product development, marketing, production. Nobody was in sales, mm -hmm. and I decided to do that. And it was the most unbelievable learning experience for three decades for me to go through that. That when I speak to people today, and especially the young generation, mm -hmm. just getting out of school, be before they pursue being, whether it be an engineer, a lawyer, uh, accountant, uh, go in the Wall Street, whatever, whatever passion or dream they want to do, I still think that the best day-to-day uh, -day training that anyone can do just getting out of college is to get into sales in some way 
whether it's pharmaceutical sales, whether it's a nutritional company, whether it's selling uh, coat hangers for, uh, and just being facetious. Uh, I, a... think, I think every youngster, uh, I think it's a great groundbreaking to experience the interpersonal reaction, uh, relationships and, and the selling and then move on to whatever field you want to get into. The thing about that is <clears throat> when I built my company, okay, and it was elite companies worldwide, I took in housewives because I didn't have any money. In other words, it started with me, and then I hired one person, then another, another, as soon as I made money. And the one thing I learned that is you couldn't take a person, no matter how wonderful they were, and make them a salesperson. Wow. It really is a genetic thing. Yes, I it's agree like with you. It's like you have it or I you agree. don't have it. I agree it. with you. So the one thing that I think young people should do is they should be entrepreneurial. They shouldn't go into a job saying, oh, I'll go to, to work for this company and they'll take care of me. You know, they'll take care of my life and my promotions, blah, blah, blah. No, I believe everyone should try to start their own business in some shape or form and, and not go into life and saying, um, you know, I'll, I'll jump into this job and the job will take care of me. You know, but of I, course, of course, you have to have the entrepreneurial spirit, which of course I don't know where that came from either. Right. But you know, it it's there, and I I did it. Well, as I said in the beginning of the show, I mean, we have to, we need to get into this because I I, I want to hear the whole story, and I find it fascinating. Uh, once again, what's uh, so remarkable and uh, appealing to me having you come here into the studio on the show is you don't meet too many people that either in the past, even my dad when he started uh, started the business um, with what he had to start with, uh, it's very unusual for he to hear either in the past, uh, the present, or the future for me to sit with someone that, uh, that says that starting a business with no money, no connections, no mentors, and creating a multi-million dollar business. And I think for the audience, um, I think it's really important now to share your personal story of, of starting, building, and then remarkably selling this national and international hotel supplier company. So I'd love to hear more about it, and, and, I, and the audience, I think, would like to hear about it. Okay. It's just fascinating. First of all, it was very, very hard work. A, number one. Number two, I was driven. I was really driven to make money. You know, I had children, and then my children needed more and more as they grew. But to start off with, I just, um, I went door-to-door -to, -door to hotels, just like I did when I used to sell Stanley Home products in okay, my community. Okay, real, real quickly, why why this area, this industry of uh, lodging and uh, hotel you. hospitality? I'm why gonna, that? Okay, I'm tell go you. ahead. After I finished selling Stanley Home Products, someone came to me from a regular janitorial supply house and asked me if I'd like to go work for them. Of course, it was still commission. I was still 1099, you know. And I used to go door to door instead of housewives. I used to sell to fire departments, nursing homes, hospitals, wow. funeral homes, Incredible. Burger King, Arby's, any place that used janitorial supplies. As a matter of fact, Dean, I had gone to your company. I used to go door to door to industrial parks, and I came across your company. Wow. And I even sold something to your company as well. Well, you probably didn't. I probably wasn't there. No. I was probably you traveling. Weren't. I was on the. You can't be good at sales sitting behind a desk. No, so uh, no. I was somewhere uh, either uh, in the United States or internationally uh, selling. So I went door to door, and that was very, very hard work. Extremely hard work doing that. There was nothing fun about it at all. But I was driven. You know, hard was driven. work, extremely hard work. Mm -hmm. But an, as I said about this generation, what a great experience. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, if you want, you know, it's, I have this saying, do be. Do it and you'll be it. Right. Talk about it and you have nothing. You just have a bunch of talk and air. So to tell you how, one day I just, and, and then I got uh, called by another janitorial supply company to come work for, to, work, to sell their products. I was still at 1099, you know, on my own, 100% on my own. And one day I said, I wonder how it feels to sell to, in Manhattan. So I took me, I always took me places, I took me into Manhattan. And as I was coming up the escalator, landing on 7th Avenue, I saw this huge building, huge building in front of me. 
and it was the Pennsylvania Hotel. Wow. And at that was at that time it was the sixth largest hotel in the world. Mm. And I just stood there and I did what I always did when I went to sell to hotels, motels on Long Island. I counted the number of windows. And the reason for counting the number of windows is that told me what type of volume discounts to give them. Okay, that's how I knew what to do. So I counted, 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 and all of a sudden I said, oh my God, I can't count all these windows because it wrapped around the block. So right then and there, just like when I made a decision to teach myself to read, right then and there I decided I'm going to sell to hotels in Manhattan. Okay, so that's how it all started. Yeah, wow. I mean, you know, it's like, duh, if you want to sell, you sell to, to where you can get large volume. Okay, and so that's what I did. It took me a solid year going door to door, getting thrown out. Um, I used to go into Manhattan twice a week, and the other three days I still uh, ran the companies I sold to on Long Island. And for those two days a week, I, um, I would see 13 hotels each day when I was in Manhattan. So I would see 26 hotels you a know, week. You know, we we have uh, some stories to share, you and I, yeah. about this, because I started in Manhattan first. Mm -hmm. And I've got to ask you, Sheila, mm -hmm. how how in hell did you, did, were you able to make six, how many calls, 13 or 16 calls a day? 13 how'd calls. You do, how'd you do that? I would leave my house at 4.30 in the morning, take the bus in. All right. It used to take, uh, there was a bus that used to go in. That bus ride was two hours. Get off, uh, get out of the bus on, I think it was 34th and 3rd. Then take another bus going all the way uptown wow. to uh, 65th Street. And I'd start uptown. And I'd get there in time for the executive housekeeper because they got there in the morning. Amazing. And who was the only salesman there at 730 in the morning? Sheila. Wow. And so that's what I used to do. And I used to work my way all the way downtown till I got to Penn Station. And when I got home, I literally fell asleep in the chair. It was very mm. hard work. And in each building, I would see several different departments. So that's what I did. That's a remarkable story. And the way I used to get myself to go from the next hotel to the next hotel, right, is I used to say, if you see three more hotels, Sheila, when you get to the next hotel, I'm going to buy you a Nestle's Crunch Bar. And by the time I got home, I remember emptying my pockets out with all these Nestle's Crunch Bars because you really had to move. And in the beginning, they used to, they used to, they used to just go, who are you and what are you doing here? And I used to go, and then I taught myself, then, I, then just from observation, I would just, well, first of all, when I wanted to go see the, the people in charge, they always told me, um, just call them from the house phone. And no one wanted to see me. Nobody wanted to see me, of course, because every company in the world tr tried to sell to Hyatt's and Hilton's and Marriott's. So I decided, this is a bunch of nonsense. So I said, there has to be a way to get to purchasing. So I went to the elevators and I went up on the elevators and I went on the floor and I saw a maid's cart and I go, she got up here from somewhere. So I searched the halls till I found the doors that took me to back of the house. And then I took the elevators downstairs to wow. where, where purchasing was, housekeeping, food and beverage and everybody was. And I had to walk around. I had to, I had to walk around as if I as if I worked there, not that I was some salesperson. And this is a great story. So I used to walk around like I knew where I was going, and sometimes I ran into dead ends till I finally found housekeeping. And I went in there and I introduced myself, and they said, Who are you and what do you want? Get out. And I said, Okay. And I just smiled and didn't say anything bad. But I learned what to, how to handle this in the future because I used to keep coming back because I knew. So I used, the, I used to do something called the Sheila Pop, which means <laughs> I used to go to the office. Would not I would not step into the office. I would just say, hi, it's me again. I'm not coming in. I just want to show you that I'm still around, and I want to ask you one question. And this, this is the question everyone needs to write down if they don't really don't know it. What product are you looking for that your other suppliers have not given you or what pricing are you looking for that your other suppliers haven't given to you? Or what service haven't you been getting? And they would tell me. And I still did not enter. And I'd write everything down. 
And every day I'd get this huge collection of things that these hotels did not have. And that taught me what to get. And I, I went to every trade show, not hotel show. I went to every trade show to find these pro products. I used to go to a trade show. No, but at this point in time with what you're sharing with the audience mm -hmm. right now and with me, mm -hmm. at this point in time, these were this was not your own product or your own brand of products at this point in time. Weren't you a independent contractor okay. for yourself representing a, okay. A, okay. another line at this point in history? Okay. Is that correct? That's true. Okay. So I skipped over stuff, but let's get I'm gonna go to that right now. So I would go door to door selling Jantro supplies to hotels. And then one day, um, one of the purchasing agents said to me, uh, Sheila, I want you to bid. I want you to give me a quote on blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, I already did. She goes, I know you did. You did that from the company that you're an outside contractor for. She says, but I want you to give me a quote from your company. And I says, I'm very sorry, Naris. I says, but... I, I don't, I won't um, hurt the company that I'm working for. I won't double cross them. And she says, are you refusing to give me a price? You know, and I have thousands of rooms. And I says, I'm not refusing. I just don't think it's ethical to do that. In other words, to, to play two sides, to play two sides. And she says, uh, you'll have to excuse me now. I'm busy. So I left. I was sad. But I felt I did the right thing because I don't believe in doing anything that I can't tell everybody about. Mm. By the time I got to my next hotel, she had already called up, I think, almost every purchasing agent in the city to say, look out, there's an honest woman roaming <laughs> the streets. And that's actually how my, my business started to get better. And then I made a decision that um, because they started asking me for things that, of course, my janitorial supply house didn't have. So what I would do is I would sell, if it had to do with the products he had, I would sell those products. If it was products that he did not offer, I would do it through out of my own company. Mm -hmm. And I, I went and I incorporated and I created a company name. And then I started selling his products and my products. What uh, what was the name of your company? Uh, Elite Companies. Okay. And then when so at this point you were uh, you were you were offering your own products mm -hmm. that didn't compete with his products. Okay, and you were offering the third party uh, products as well. I was offering his products okay. as well, and it was uh, going pretty good. And but my so that that's what I did. So um, and so my my first entree. What was really happening, Dean, was I was learning an industry by asking questions. By not, I wasn't being a me too person. You know, like, I can get that for you too. I can get a better price. I, you know, I did that, you know, when necessary. But I learned the industry and I learned things they needed more than they knew because I saw it from many, some 26 hotels a week plus. And I started creating products that was never in the industry before. For example... I created, you know, the iron and the ironing board in the guest room closet. That was me. You, wow. Okay. You created that. I did. And you ever go in a hotel and you see a blanket and a blanket bag? Yes. Yes. That was me. Wow. Wrap Q-tips, cotton balls. So basically you invented those. I invented things. And wow. that's because when I was in there, I was always observing, observing, observing. So how did I get to be so observant? Because when I lived in the projects... Unless I can observe my environment deeply, I can be killed or raped or murdered. Wow. wow. So it's those observation skills. Also, since I didn't know how to read, and I used to have to go through streets in Brooklyn, I didn't know, I didn't know how to read the signs. So I used to have to become like a tracker. So I used to go, okay, I'll make a right turn here. There's a, a white awning and this and that, because I used to love to take long walks, but I had to get back. So because I had that, not reading and uh, all the situations, it taught me to have extra skills that I would never have had. Skills that came out because I was a survivor. So let's say with the iron, the ironing board, which was for me, no, not a big, uh, not a big thing. When I used to do seventeen trade shows a year across the country as my business grew. I used to call up housekeeping to bring up a nine or ninety board, and then I used to put it under the bed because I knew if it was a three thousand room Marriott and it was a business hotel, 
unless I get this product the day before, I wasn't going to have it. Right. And so I said, you know, I bet you everyone has this problem. So I went to operations and I said to them, how much do you pay for these five housemen to bring up irons and ironing boards? And he told me. And I says, even paying these people to do this all day long, I said, how much, how much uh, customer complaints? He said, a lot, because they couldn't, you know. So I, said, I made a proposal out. I says, you buy these products from me, put them in the rooms. You don't have to use those housemen to do that. You can have them do something else, and you'll get, you'll, you'll get great praise from your clients. So they did. Mm. So I sold it to the Hilton chain, the Hyatt chain, the Marriott chain. I sold all the chains, that one product, as well as, um, as well as other products. And it was all from knowledge of the industry. So if someone goes into business, they can't go in there blinded. They have to look around at everything. What they have to do is they have to look for opportunities. They're not going to just jump out at your face. It's not going to be something you read in a book at school. You have to use your mind. You have to say, what problems are there here that I can solve? And I did well. You did real well. So you, you decided you wanted to be in this industry called hospitality, hotel, lodging. You said that uh, there's uh, the universe is using. Uh, I'm saying. Is, is, I'm, the universe is, what, is using that industry. No, I'm saying there's big money in those buildings. Period. End of story. I looked at the building. It had thousands of rooms. My brain went. Da -da. I can sell them one product and they put it in every room. I sold 3,000 products, not brain surgery. Right. I was going to ask you how broad, eventually, how broad was this product line? Well, it wasn't a matter of how broad it was. It was a matter that there, I sold to tens of thousands of hotels. Okay. World, worldwide? Well, in the United States, think of you know, Holiday Inn, for example, has 7,000 rooms. Right. No, 7,000 hotels. And how many does the Hyatt and the Hilton? So you're looking, I sold to tens of thousands of hotels. Wow. And um, I hope I hope uh, you and Michael over the years got uh, good rates at hotels. Did you with selling them? No. No. <laughs> no. I tell you, I got to, I was tickled pink when I I finally got to go to a nice hotel and and paid for it. You know, because I that's not where I was from. And the other thing that was interesting was is I had to learn how to hold myself, how to be. Because I decided to focus on four and five star hotels because I figured out they're going to pay the bill. If I went to a hotel where they decide not to pay me anything because I had no money, no like zero in the bank, and I'm doing all, I'm rolling all this business over. So I only sold to four and five star hotels. End of story. So in my journey, I had to learn how to be like they were. Unconsciously, I was imitating them. I was, my mannerisms, my dress, don't forget, you know, you know, not too many years before I had this accent. They want to know what country I came from. So I just, I, not purposely, but just by being there and observing. So my clients in my four and five star properties, they used to come to me and say to me, Mrs. Skolnick, could you tell me what I can do for my hotel to make it better than the other five-star hotel. Wow. And so I, somehow I also became like their advisor. Of course, I advised them for their own good and uh, sold them something. Like, how did I learn to do the blanket bag, which I made a fortune on? I'll tell you that one really quick. Um, you know, the, the other thing that wasn't added to your background and resume as we go on with this show is uh, I, I didn't know you were an inventor. Me neither. It's pretty remarkable. I had something to sell them, you so have, there I went. You have an unbelievable personal, interpersonal skill set. You have tremendous sales uh, background that obviously is genetic. Um, you know what? But, it's but, some, it's but something I do have that's self-taught. This no, this no money issue, we've got we've to gotta focus that on a, a little bit because, once again, once you have a product and whether you're uh, – um, in-house, you're making these products personally yourself no. or whether you're outsourcing and no. buying them from, no. it still, it still takes at times capital. What was, what was your, I, I, I think I have an idea where you're going to go with this, but wh how did you handle that situation that well, first of as, all as, as your customer demand and you needed product, how did you, uh, that cash flow and, um, purchasing, how'd you handle all that? First of all, I decided after um, being in business for two years that I should go to a bank and try to get a loan. 
uh, because I figured, oh, I'll probably need it. But what I really did was, is I didn't take any money out of the business. I lived as poor as I was when I got in there. I would sell something after it was sold and got paid. I bought something, sell something, get paid, buy again. And I only purchased, I only bought what the customers needed. I didn't warehouse stuff and hope to sell it. I sold them what they needed. You know, in other words, I, I rolled, I kept rolling the money. So does that mean money. your suppliers, your suppliers basically carry, they held your inventory and you, you pulled that inventory as, as needed? No. No? Okay. Uh-uh. First of all, my suppliers said, no, uh-uh. What I did was, let's say I needed ironing boards. Okay. All right. I would get a purchase order for um, ironing boards. Okay. And I had the money in from the last orders. In other words, I built this up like a like a wheel, you know, in, out, in, out, in, out. And I just kept managing it and managing it and managing it. In other words, it was a, I don't even know how I did that. And um, no, they didn't hold it. When I needed, I purchased it. I have one story you're going to love. So I want to keep hearing about these highlights. So I had, I had, you know, I, as I said, I had been selling to all the four and five star hotels and I became like sort of part of the building. Everyone knew me. The doorman knew me because I was, I just went to every department. How can I help? How can I help? So they knew Sheila. How can I help? That was always out of my mouth. Not what can I sell you? Or here's a great product. You need it. You know, you should have it. It's the best price, the blah, blah, blah. So nothing was ever the best. If you, if you needed it, then it was the best for you, period, end of story. So anyway, I go, I, I, I go to the Plaza Hotel, and I walk in, and I look around, and it doesn't look right. And I, I went to purchasing, and I said, Susan, what, who bought that stuff? You know, what's with the green velvet stanchions? And she goes, we were purchased by the Trumps. And this is, <laughs> and this is, and this is what, they chose you don't have to say that so low they were purchased by the trumps yes you could say it louder <laughs> yes <laughs> and so at any rate i went home back to my home office which was a spare bedroom still and i wrote a letter i wrote dear mrs trump um congratulations on your um i didn't make it to mr trump i went it to mrs trump because she was running the building dear mrs trump congratulations on the purchase of your new uh property however this is a five, a four-star historic building, and if you continue decorating it the way you're decorating it and enhancing it how you're enhancing it, you will lose your investment. You know, I sent it out. I figured, what do I got to lose? No one's going to hurt me. No one's going to hit me. I mailed it out. I get a phone call the next day from the purchasing agent that says, Mrs. Trump wants to meet you right away. Wow. And I said... I'm so sorry, I can't come till next week. And he says, what do you mean you can't come till next week? I says, I cannot come till next week. He goes, all right. And he says, how about Wednesday? I go, nope, I can only come Tuesday or Thursday. I don't think that person's used to uh, Mrs. Trump being told that as an answer, that, uh, well, was, that you're going to have to wait a, a week or two or three. Well, ask me why I didn't go. Why didn't you go? I didn't know what to wear. <laughs> I did not know what to wear. You know, one of the things I teach and train all my all my uh, uh, students and clients is to mirror. You have to mirror your client because if you mirror your client, no matter what you say, starting out, no matter what I say, no matter what I do, if I mirror you and you think I look like you and I'm like you, then you think I know what's good for you. Hmm. That's just the way the world works. End of story. Cop wears a cop uniform, a nurse wears is a nurse's uniform. So I did go to the city the next day, on an off day, and I stood on the corner of Fifth Avenue and 57th Street, and I watched how the women, you know, the high style women, what they wore. I always wore things like banker suit, very staunch, very whatever, you know, very uh, hardcore. Uh, man-like kind of ish right, you know right. and um because i was the only female walking the halls so i had to look very not like a female i had to look very um hardcore whatever that means i figured out what to wear and as a matter of fact i noticed they were wearing this little um these little uh, cloth flowers as a on the jacket and i bought a suit that had a pemblum and i thought about the color of the nail polish on my nails and when I, and then I said, you know, I think I got it together. I did this shopping. And I says, I think I look like high style, how she would probably 
how she would probably look like, and I had no idea. I go to see her. She opens the door. She is wearing the identical flower on her jacket wow. that I was wearing, and I thought to myself, nailed it. So you know, getting what a what a great story. Life what is a, all what a fascinating story. I, I teach and train this all day long, mm -hmm. and um, so we went in. So after the initial reactions were good. Uh, we did a walkthrough of the property, and we got along great. She's a hard, hard-working woman. I mean, she walked around in her spike heels. I think there were eight. There were eight hundred employees. She knew them all, and um, I wound up selling them millions of dollars worth of merchandise. And unlike the things people say, I got paid all day. I think the audience is going to ask which Mrs. Trump this was. Ivana Trump. <laughs> Ivana. Ivana. Ivank is the daughter. This is the mother. That's right. Because I always That's get it. asked. And I remember seeing the, her children with her in her office. And she was a great mother. And she used to be very strict with the children. She, I remember she used to go, you sit down and you wait till I'm finished and don't interrupt. So she really, she really gave them discipline and she gave them structure. And that's why she has such fine children. We traveled for uh, many years, for about 15 years during the uh, this time of year. We used to go with our kids when they were younger. We used to travel to Aspen. Mm -hmm. They talked me into skiing. Uh, uh, I was too old at that point uh, to start skiing. I, I did it along with them for 15 years. But uh, we had a chance to uh, meet Ivana during those uh, years uh, in, uh, in Aspen. Uh, that uh, she's quite a lady and uh, mm -hmm. from from what we were able to experience and see and from what I hear from people, uh, a very big part of the reason how those children the have, have turned out today. Unbelievable. And they were respectful. And she wasn't the kind of mother that just shooed them off. You know, she was uh, European and they grew up with European discipline. Right. And when I hear the when I hear the boys on TV now talking, the first thing I thought of was, I know that voice. And they have the tonality of their mom. Right. You know how you, genetically you have certain things. Right. And they had the same type of speed in, in talking, just like their mom did. And I, I get goosebumps. I go, oh, look how the kids turned out. They're so good. <laughs> look how the daughters <laughs> turned out. Oh, my God. She, she's, uh, there. Well, it, you know, it's trickle down. I believe totally in trickle down. And uh, it all trickled well. So anyway, that was my experience. So let's let's move on with uh, your company. Uh, it uh, it went on for how many years before, and how many employees, and and uh, at some point you uh, you decided to uh, sell it to a huge six billion dollar company. This company nope. called Enterprise. No, uh, I didn't. No, okay. I didn't. No, okay. I, no, okay. No. Okay. No. 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 Okay. So let's hear the history. Well, first of all, with my employees, I um, came into the company. I mean, I started this company from my house, and then I realized, oh my God, I can't answer this phone and talk to this phone. Then I said, you know, I got to get someone to help me. So I got, you know, uh, minimum wage, and I kept getting minimum wage housewives because that's all I could afford. And as it turned out, that was the best thing that ever happened because I trained them how I thought and how I thought I made up because I never did any of this work before. I never did accounting or purchasing or or sales, or I never did any of those things. I just made everything up as I went along. Mm. And it was just for me all based on what I saw was needed, not something I learned that this is how it's supposed to be, because there's no such thing as how it's supposed to be. And um, so I taught them, and they all mirrored me. Wow. And because I used to sit, as my company grew, I had more and more employees, and I used to teach and train them. I used to be with them all the time, not all the time, but I used to... I didn't have everyone separated. I wanted to them all to be in the same huge room so they can hear each other, so they can hear the problems and situations. And and they I'm still I still have my core um, employees, wow. my core management group, uh, because I really love them and they love me and that's sort of like even weird. But it all worked because they knew I felt that the most important thing be even before your customer is your employees, because you're, it's your employees that take care of your customers. Mm. So you have to treat your employees like gold, you know, because don't forget when I'm not there, I'm off on my 17 train shows or in the city working, they're running my company. Now I never had things like managers or people in charge. Everyone, everyone, 
I, everyone had responsibilities to take care of, and they all took care of all their responsibilities. And when I was away, I never had a thing for a second. Things weren't being done or, you know, because if I had an employee that came into the mix that wasn't good, you know, like they say, one bad apple destroys the bunch, which, by the way, they do. I used to have to have them leave. I didn't tell them it was them. I used to say it was me. But uh, and I kept a really solid group that were like this. One of my employees, I bet you include, I bet you equal 20 of anyone else's wow. employees. Guaranteed, because we were strong. And I had circle ups where we all discussed what was going on. And we all, I encouraged everyone to interact, interplay. Plus, I, I had a, um, I created a computer system. I was back in the day. Um, that turned out to be one of the fastest, fastest systems to work because I couldn't keep up with my, with I couldn't keep up with the number of clients without a really fast and good, solid computer system. Um, so we sort of rolled. We sort at, of at, at you know at, at the height of your business. How many employees did you have? Well, I had outside contractors around the country, right? Because don't forget, it was a country. You know, it was all over. I had different people all over doing different things. Um, so you had a lot of outside contractors. It wasn't necessarily in-house. Uh, no, no, I had company employees. No, no, no. I had, I had combination salary. of both. I had, yeah, I had salaried employees. Right. But the one, I what about thirty, thirty-five, something like that, off mm. the top of my head, all in all. Um, but I was a very big believer of sharing. So even down to the warehouse person, um, if the company made money. They made money. At the end of the year, everybody made money. Wow. So I made them all part of the company. I mean, they were all part. They all got money from, from you know, I made money, they made money, even when I sold my business. Now I see why you've got this business and speaking and teaching and coaching because uh, you had a uh, fully integrated philosophy and, and uh, culture mm -hmm. for so many years that worked mm -hmm. that... Uh, that you could be helping uh, small, large businesses all over the world with, I do. with what you do. I do. As right. a matter of fact, in some of, in, I have great stories to tell. Um, for example, if it's to be, it's up to me, right? I teach that. Everything I teach, I teach with a story, and I teach with a why. And the stories are all my stories. So there weren't stories that I read in a book or that someone told me. These are actually what I did, what occurred many, many times, and I tell them, look, this happened, then because of this happening, this happened. Cause and effect, cause and effect, with actual examples. And I think I have 47 of them, but I teach and train that, and that's what I speak about. Um, and the other thing I teach them is to act as if. Remember I said to you I came from a culture that was less than less. Mm. And then when I went into the lodging industry, I, I had to change how I was. I had to sit a certain way. You know, I just, I didn't do it on purpose. It was like natural to just copy. And I taught them to act as if. So these wonderful, wonderful women, they, they didn't come from any money at all. And when they used to have to go in the field, because some of them I did make go in the field because they had the ability, uh, I used to make sure they wore pearls. And I used to tell them how to dress. I used to tell them, act as, so you, in other words, you have to act as if you belong somewhere. You have to act as if um, you know what you're talking about. Of course, don't talk unless you know what you're talking about. The one thing I used to teach everybody is if you don't know the answer, don't say that. Mm -hmm. don't, don't give an answer, please. I said, just say, I will get back to you and we'll find it out. So you had legitimacy and all my clients knew that I was doing what was right and best for them. So act as if was huge because I used to walk into hotels and I used to, I used to, after I quit sneaking upstairs, I started going, why should I sneak, go upstairs and then go down the elevator, the side elevator down to the basement. I go, I'm going right through security. So, <laughs> <laughs> chutzpah, <laughs> major chutzpah. So, so you had all the chutzpah, you I, knew, you knew. So I used, you, I used what, to walk through security. Whatever, whatever you had to do to uh, get the right person's attention and, and close a purchase order in well, the hotel. No, no. Whatever was the most important thing, whatever was right for them. People see through you. Big business see, see through you in a second. You might have sold one thing to one hotel that wasn't good and got paid, but you're not selling the other 30000 
So you always have to look big, 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 big picture. Okay, so so once again, uh, as as we discussed with your lovely husband, I, I think we're going to have to have many shows that you come back on that we could do because we could go on and on. I know, but what but at 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 some time, and this is just fascinating your your whole uh, life story, uh, your personal story, as well as your business story. Uh, one that uh, I haven't heard before. This is remarkable. You're quite a lady. Um, uh, at at one point, at some point in your life, you made a decision that you were going to, that you got out of the uh, hospitality and the lodging and the hotel business. No, no, no. I didn't make a decision. They called me up they, and they said to me, uh, we want to buy your company. And I, I, I went, who is this? <laughs> And they said, you want to buy your company? And I said, no. I said, no. And then what happened after that? I hung up the phone. I went, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then, <laughs> oh, my God. Can't believe it. And then So you got, a, you got a call that someone so then, wanted to buy your company. And then they told me who they were. You didn't want to sell your company. Someone called Listen up and said me. they want to buy your Wait, company. I didn't, I didn't go out to sell my company. Uh, but, you know, I had no idea what the value, the value, the hard value of my company was. At I this did. point, when that call happened, you didn't yeah, know. Yeah, I didn't know the value. I know we're rolling millions and millions and millions, but I didn't, I never stopped to analyze the numbers. You know, at, at the beginning of my business, I don't know the difference between a debit and a credit. All I knew is it cost me 50 cents. I sold it for a dollar. I got 50 cents in my pocket. Actually, 40 cents because 10% for operations that's all i knew that's how i kept rolling every everything i did was how much did it cost me how much did i sell it for and what's my overhead and that rolled into millions so it doesn't have to be you don't have to know everything you you get to know it by doing no do do be do be do be so that's what i did so when they called me i said no and then they kept throwing numbers at me and i kept going sheila what what if this ends <laughs> so now of course i said yes so uh, it was, it was uh, as a matter of fact, I got to meet Jack Taylor, who just died at 94 or something. And I hadn't said yes to the numbers yet. So they invited me on his yacht. That's the Jack Taylor, the owner of Enterprise and the founder of Enterprise Rent-A-Car. And I went on. He his, recently passed away. Yeah. yeah. And I, we went on his yacht and it was fabulous. And wow. he, he just, he was, he just loved us. He just loved us. I was supposed to only be there for like. What did he? What did he at that moment? What did he love about uh, the business? What was it that he uh, wanted to buy my business? I mean, my business was first of all. I had uh, by then I was doing like eleven container loads of merchandise from China. I mean, I was. I mean, I had factories in China. I mean, I I manufactured products in China. I was the manufacturer, so my my uh, profit levels. You know, my profit was through the roof. Because I used to buy something for, let's say, I don't know, $10, sell it for $30. So the profit level, and I had good quality products. I had my sources overseas. I had my products that we, we sold. I had, I had thousands of hotels. And I created a database, a, uh, what they call, you know, a database with everyone's name, mm -hmm. address, not just name and address, but what the kids, what their children were, you know, all details that anyone can just sit in, into the computer and take over and fly the plane because my business was solid. I was very, very big on um, of if someone, I always thought to myself, what if one of my salespeople left? What were they doing? So everything had to go into my database. Everything went in there. So if someone did leave, well, we just slipped in there. It was all in front of them because mm. it don't, it made sense. Everything had to make sense for me. And even when I got my um, uh, accounting program, I had to have the best accounting program because I knew that I couldn't be in the streets and watch the money at the same time. Couldn't do both. So I had to have a, 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 a something that no one could steal, you know, money. And I set up the biggest, the, the most complicated accounting program. So we had the best databases. We had the fastest uh, uh, computers. No one had computers faster than mine wow. for that price. So what year? What so? What year was it that you sold the business to Enterprise? I don't want to tell you. A long time ago. Long time ago. Okay. So so once again, you sold you sold the business, and then you got into. Oh, by uh, the way, Enterprise was wonderful people. Like probably the best people you'll ever meet in your life. Wow. Seriously, seriously, they were they were great, great people. That's super. 
Well, congratulations. That's a great story. That's a really great story. Thank you. Then how did it all come about getting into personal training and coaching and and, well, uh, when, well, first of all, when speaking I speaking and all the all, things that you do today, first of all, when I sold the business, um, they had asked me to stay on and I helped run the com com company for, I don't know, a year or so. And then it just, I just didn't want to because they would, they would, they were not, um, it wasn't how I wanted it to be, how I knew it to be. So and it doesn't really matter. How did it happen? I stopped working. And it was like I went through a windshield, a car crashing into a wall a, because a body in motion tends to stay in motion. motion. You know, I, I was young. I was young. and, and I Young, was, this is an unbelievable rags to riches story that your journey, this is not a journey that you just read out of some a book or a textbook. I made it up. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did. Well, you know, maybe not knowing how to read was great because Michael, I didn't. Michael sitting here in the studio, your husband Michael, uh, great guy. He's uh, he's laughing uh, he's as a he's gift listening. From God. He's, he's a quite gift. a he's quite a guy. He's he quite a guy. A great as man. I told you when you met Sharon earlier, and you had a chance to have her great muffins here, uh, as Lovely. all my all my guests. His get. wife, by the way, is beautiful. <laughs> An incredible thank, thank, figure. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much. Really appreciate that. But, uh, you know, one of the great satisfactions I told you guys when you came here today is I love talking to people. And all through my through this radio show just being launched uh, this past uh, July, uh, all the new people that I get a chance to meet and the stories that I hear just like yours are just a great experience. Thank you. It really is so Thank you. but uh you know you can't make this up this is uh just you know really an incredible rags to riches your story is is remarkable and, and you know uh, one of the things in my life that i i i'm solid about is that i want to pass it on i want to i pass my thinking on i pass my my how i do things on and and that's what i'm up to and that's how i get into speaking because i know what i know and i know it works and I just want to share it in a bigger way with uh, business people. So, Sheila, you still feel even even in this time and this day and age, even the younger generation or just people wanting to start a new business, that they could really start it that way, the way you did it back in your old days. Yeah. Uh, wow. You wow. know, the thing is, people go, I can't. I don't have this. I don't have that. It's like, stop whining and go do something. And go do it. And go do Just, it. You know, what's what worth, you know, if, if you have nothing, what are you going to lose? So if anyone wants to contact you for your business and your services, I think it's uh, SheilaTalks.com. Is that right. correct? Right. So that's my website. And where uh, else can they go to? Well, they can call me, you know, Sheila Skolnick. Um, they can call me 631 875 1555. 631 875 1555. Uh, but visit my website. You'll learn all about me. You'll see my videos. Um, and even my business card has a, has a, I, we, I, I did a talk in uh, Chicago and I got a standing ovation. And that was my first standing ovation because I hadn't done much talking. And it, I, I got confused. I thought they were uh, storming the stage. I didn't know they were. <laughs> <laughs> it's really weird, but that's not, that's something I hadn't experienced before. So this is like a continuation of my adventures, you know, my adventures. Now, yesterday I spoke to the Sunshine. Uh, there's a Sunshine organization that um, schools children that were taken out of school. And so they they teach and they train them. And I had the honor of speaking to them. And I really want to give back to children as well. So I spoke to them and, um, you know, tell them they, they come from problem homes, problem situations. So my talk to them was, you know, the first thing I said to them, if you look at me, what do you see? I said, do you, do you, you know, raise your hands if you think I look like I come from a wealthy home and wealth, wealthy money, blah, blah. And they did. I said, guess what? That's not, not so. Wow. That's and, a great story. And, you know, so I hope to give other even children back, you know, to give back and show them it's possible. You know, it's all possible. So what's the advice that you have for kids getting out of college today and getting into business? What do you, what do you, what do you tell well, them? Well, first of all, they have to grow up. That's A number one. I'm watching this where they're, they're having crying parties. I, I don't understand that. But besides that, my advice to them is to 
yeah, sure, go out and go into your profession if you can. But also think very hard about becoming an entrepreneur, having starting your own business, your own con company. You know, if you can do that before you get married and, and before you take on a mortgage and everything else, you have a shot in the dark of building your own company. And this country has been built upon entrepreneurs. And, you know, with our new president coming on board, um, there's going to be tremendous entrepreneurs. He's an entrepreneur himself, so there's going to be tremendous opportunities. You know, in this day and age, I don't know if I could have done what I did because, you know, as big as I got, because entrepreneurialism was big, you know, really big. Um, so I would say get out of college and start thinking about how you can create your own business. And most important thing is look for opportunities. You know, things do not have to look a certain way. You can create anything you want but look for opportunities. And if you want to talk to me about it, call me, see me, go to SheilaTalks.com. I'd be more than happy to speak to you. And um, one of my other uh, principle is the following. Not asking is an automatic no. Okay? So don't be afraid to ask. To ask. You know, not asking, it's automatically no. So ask. And the other thing is, um, say the other thing I teach and train is say yes to everything, everything, unless it's not legal, not moral, could hurt you or somebody else. And I said yes, and I got to go to Hong Kong as a, a wow. diplomat wow. Uh, representing our country. I didn't go, I didn't go, no, I don't, I don't know how to do that. I thought about it, and I, it met my criteria, and I said, yes, I'd be happy to go. So say yes to everything. So those are those are just some of my um, some of my advice, all based upon my history. And look, I'm still here. I'm living, you know. And I have a son that went through uh, Cornell uh, Ivy League schools, and my two sons, uh, Jason and Glenn, are doing very very Lovely. well. You guys are really blessed. Yeah. Well, really however, are. we are blessed. However, we made it so. It just didn't fall on us. Not everyone, not every human being is so blessed to to come from parents that have money, that that are highly educated, and not and most people don't have the benefits um, to go and do and be. But you, the individual, just has to say, "I'm going to do it," and don't come up with excuses. Why not? Come up with reasons why you can. So just put that in your head. No reasons why not but reasons why you can, and your brain will move you forward. Right, right. So do you enjoy at this point in your life working with uh, people that are looking to uh, embark on startup companies? I love it. Or do you, or do you prefer to deal with, uh, with companies that are existing that are going through day-to-day uh, -to -day challenges with uh, no matter what they might be with with day-to-day -day challenges and how do they take their company to the next level? Which which do you prefer today to, to deal with or both? I like it all. You know, anytime I could step into a situation and give them a piece of information and help that comes from my head, I get like really great joy because what good is it just sitting in my head? When I could walk into a building or a place, an office or a, con or a company, and I could just see what is wrong, you know, what's wrong with the culture, what's happening. You know, an owner can either, you know, sprinkle uh, stardust on his employees or he can sprinkle crap on them. And when you sprinkle crap on them, you're going to get crap everything. So it's just shifting how you think about things. And it's also thinking what makes sense, what doesn't make sense. I mean, you must be flooded with calls constantly, uh, daily, weekly, with uh, with coming into companies. And uh, what's it going to take to get Sheila in here to be a turnaround specialist? A phone that must, call. That must, happen a phone all the, call. that must happen all the time to you. Just a phone call. That's all that it takes. Huh? It just takes a phone call. I still have my high energy 24-7. Well, before, before I close the show... Uh, I'm afraid to ask you this. Uh, I think Michael's going to bite his tongue and he's going to say, Dean, you shouldn't ask uh, Sheila this. We'll be here for another five hours. But I want to I ask you, is there anything that you and I didn't discuss that you'd like to discuss or share with the audience that we haven't covered here today? You know, I lived a lot of years. Of course, there's a lot of stuff. <laughs> well, you're going to have to come back again, okay? I'll tell you what. Who thing. knows? Who knows? Maybe uh, you'll like this experience so much that uh, maybe you'll come back and co-host or co-anchor. Uh, I would or, love it. Uh, you're welcome to come back here 
any time. I it's would been love a it. it's been a wonderful it's been a wonderful time and, and an experience. And I so appreciate you're asking me. And I'll let you know right now, I enjoyed you very much. You can't see his face, but this man has a smiling, glowing face. It's a pleasure to look at him from across the, uh, from across the desk. Well, Michael, I want to thank you very much for, uh, for being here also. We don't have too many people that uh, sit in the studio here. You were nice and quiet. Didn't move around too much on that couch, but uh, I want to say to both of you and your families, uh, happy holidays and uh, and a happy new year. And Same to, to you. To everyone, and I'm sure the audience is just loving this, uh, but, uh, you know, I, I once again, it's uh, Sheila Skolnick, uh, just a remarkable uh, entrepreneur, coach, speaker, uh, successful business lady, uh, all the above. Just a, a great, great uh, rags to riches story, a journey that uh, a life story, personal story that can't be uh, written in a book or textbook. And thanks again for being here today. Thank you very much, Steve, so, for having me. You're bad. I want to uh, hear from all our listeners. Listeners can reach out to us with the free text number for U.S. residents. It's 631 631- 372-8849. We'd love to hear from all of you. Include your name and location, and we will mention you on the show. Please don't forget to like us on Facebook and to hit the subscribe button on the show's YouTube channel. If you'd like to leave a comment, use the box below. Recently, we're now all past shows are all archived on uh, the iTunes platform. If you'd like to share your story, ideas, and be a guest on the show, Go to deanbleckman.com and email me directly from the website. If not from the website, dean, dean at deanbleckman.com. I would like to thank all my listeners for being with us today. From all of us at the Dean Blackman Show, have a great day. You've been listening to the Dean Blackman Show live from Long Island, New York. From all of us here, we'd like to thank you for tuning in. We look forward to hearing your comments via Facebook, Twitter, Skype, and email. And don't forget, you can visit the webpage anytime for the up-and-coming guest list. From all of us here, have a good evening.